Hi, this is Jeff Nupp, and you're watching the Writing Idiomatic Python video series. Welcome to the fourth video, uh, filmed a scant two years after video three, which I uh, apologize for deeply. Um, this is the attempt to get things back on track. I haven't forgotten about the series, and hopefully this is the first of uh, a number of quick releases on the Writing Idiomatic Python videos. Um, so if you remember in our third uh, video, and actually all three videos, we were kind of tangentially um, writing programs and scripts are related to web applications. So we're not writing any web applications ourselves, but we deal with things that um, are related to the web. And given the explosive popularity and growth in popularity of um, web application programming, and especially in Python, and even more especially with Flask, uh, I thought it might be useful to see what it's like to write a simple Flask application uh, from scratch. And um, we'll also look at the use of an ORM, uh, which is an object relation mapper that takes your, basically takes your Python objects and um, automatically maps them to database tables and is responsible for keeping everything in sync and up to date. Um, we'll look at SQL Alchemy, by far the most popular Python ORM. Uh, PeeWee is you know, reasonably popular, but um, nothing compared to SQL Alchemy. Um, but first we'll do it the hard way. We'll do it the uh, old fashioned way, I guess, and we'll use SQLite and raw SQL just to see what the SQL Alchemy ORM is really taken care of for us. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, I'm just going to open a editor session uh, in Vim as usual. So here we have my trusty Vim window and we're going to get started on an application which actually uh, was requested by a tutoring client. This was an uh, individual who wanted a basic a better grasp on the fundamentals of web development with Flask. He had done some tutorials online. He had done some different um, online classes. It just felt that he didn't really have a grasp of the basics and, and was getting lost as things became more complicated. And he was also having difficulty understanding SQL Alchemy and, and ORMs in general, which is perfectly understandable. They are complicated uh, pieces of code and what they do is uh, pretty involved, um, but that's not to say that we can't make use of them. Um, and in today's video, we'll see exactly, you know, at a very high level, what a ORM is doing and how it fits into the whole Flask ecosystem. So let's talk about the application my tutoring client brought to me. It was a help desk system, and in particular, uh, just a system to let you enter tickets. Um, and a ticket is a, a complaint that a user has or a customer has. Um, and so that's really the most important noun in our system. And when you're designing systems, and especially web-based systems, it's very useful to identify the nouns as most things will be actions on those nouns and um, maintaining the state of those nouns. So it's always a good thing to identify all the nouns in the system. This system only has one, of course, that's the, the ticket. Um, but we do have to describe what the ticket is. Um, and of course, you know, this being a web-based system, we want to be able to create new tickets, uh, update existing tickets, list all the tickets that are there, uh, delete tickets. So this is really the beginnings of a CRUD application. Uh, CRUD is an acronym for Create, read, update, and delete. Uh, those are the typical actions associated with a CRUD object um, and really describe exhaustively the set of actions that you're allowed to take against any of these nouns in our system. So, you know, for a ticket, we can create one, read an existing one, update an existing one, or delete one. So, first things first, let's define the actual. Um, or let's, let's describe rather the uh, actual structure of a ticket. Uh, and this comes from the clients, so not from me. Um, 
but the uh, what I'll do is I'll describe it in um, in comments in the code, and then we'll go through and see how that might map to actual SQL. So here is the description of a ticket. Uh, a ticket has an ID. This is a unique identifier, and it's an integer. We can also say that this is the primary key. So the primary key is the w the field that uniquely identifies an object in a database table. So a particular row is identified by its primary key. And um, in this case, it's just a monotonically increasing integer. Type of change, that's just a description of what kind of change the client wants to make. Um, in this case, it could be an enum, uh, as in um, the, you know, you could have a set of predefined types of changes like bug fix, new feature, um, things of that nature where you th statuses you might see on tickets in other web-based systems. Um, but for now, to keep things simple, we'll just uh, use a string. And the other factor being a, a number, most databases actually don't support uh, enumerated types. Postgres does, MySQL doesn't um, in the very literal sense. Of course, you can approximate them, but it's much easier in our case just to use a string. Title is the title of the ticket. So this is something that the client would presumably enter and it's just a descriptive title and then a description of what the actual change would be. Um, so, you know, fix the uh, closing tag on, you know, some anchor that is uh, destroying the whole HTML of my page and, and please do it ASAP. Um, submitter name, email, and website. This is really something where you would likely have these in a real system, have these linked to some sort of user table so that you're not recording the person's name, email, and website every time for what is essentially the same person entering a ticket. Um, the, because what you would be doing is repeating information across tickets and it's very easy to accidentally enter the wrong email address or get one character off on the URL for the website. Um, rather than being error prone in that way and to keep to the dry principle, don't repeat yourself, we would refactor out in, of our data model the name, email, and website into a, say, submitter uh, table or user table, and then just have a link from this ticket object to the submitter object. Um, next is file. If we allow them to do file uploads. Um, we'll largely ignore this for the time being. We'll come back to it a little later, but you can imagine that somebody has a screenshot or something that they want to attach to the ticket to show, you know, here's how badly you've screwed up my HTML. Um, and then the date created, which is just simply a date. So these types that I'm listing, um, they're not, you'll notice, standard SQL types. They're more just descriptions, almost like pseudocode descriptions of types. So everything here is an is a string, except for the ID is an integer. File is a, a file type, which we, which a database may support or not. But it's just um, to remind us that this is essentially this represents a file on disk and not just an arbitrary string. Um, although under the hood, it will definitely be stored as a string. Uh, date created is a date. Now every SQL compliant database has a date type, so we don't really have to worry about the presence of that. Um, but without further ado, let's think about how we might structure this into an actual SQL command to create the table. Um, so I'm going to, again, write this in comments here, just so we can, just because I really need a place to put it, that you're able to see it. 
but um, also because it's it'll be helpful to refer back to uh, when we're writing the code. Of course, in the end product, we would delete all this, but um, it's useful as an artifact right now, and it's useful as a way for me to show you what will we, we would be doing. So uh, I'm just going to put this in quotes, and we know that create table are going to be the first two words. Um, we're going to call it ticket with a capital T. Uh, for me, that's just a matter of preference in terms of table names and the use of uh, uppercase letters. Uh, I know some people do prefer uh, lowercase table names, and in fact, they name their tables with, if there is a space, then it'll be lowercase and underscores, just like naming a Python variable. Um, I try to stick to one word tables that start with an uppercase letter, because to me, they're essentially types, and you'll see why in a second. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we want to create the table called ticket. We'll say ID is an integer, and it is the primary key. So again, while we will eventually use a more sophisticated database, right now we're going to be using SQLite. So I'm writing this in a way that SQLite will, um, that is compatible with SQLite. Um, so type of change, we'll just say change, and that'll be a text field. And we're gonna specify that it can't be null. Um, for a lot of these, we don't care if it's null or not, but Type of change, I think, is something that definitely should not be null. Uh, title as well should not be null. So we'll just say text not null. Description, uh, just for the sake of argument, let's say that that can be null. So we just leave off the not null, and that is assumed. Submitter name is going to be text, and that's not null. Uh, but we can assume that the submitter email and website, you know, once we have the name, we can probably look those up somewhere else. So we'll allow those to be null. Next, we have the file field. Um, that's going to be text. And of course, that can be null because you're not uh, obligated to upload a file, but uh, you certainly can if you want to. And then the date created is a date, and that's not null. And if you think about it, that should actually have a default value. We shouldn't really be needing to put in a date, um, and we'll see how we would do that um, in a second. So I'm going to switch back to the shell. Um, and first, I'm going to highlight all of this. Oops. Let me do that again. OK, copy. Um, now I'm going to go back to the shell, and I'm going to uh, create a SQLite database. You should, on a Mac, be able to execute SQLite 3. Uh, then you just give it a, the name of the database, which we don't have one yet, but it will create one once we give it a name. Uh, and the name of the database is really, uh, the database itself rather, is, is just a file. SQLite operates 99% of the time on single files. It also has an in-memory mode, but uh, the file-backed version is far more popular, or far more often used, aside from, say, unit tests or something, just because if you were to create an application which uses SQLite in memory databases, when that goes down, you've lost your database. Um, and that being said, SQLite, the file-backed version, is actually sufficient for many of the web applications that y you'll see, Not the, certainly not the most popular applications out there, but for anything that you're creating where you have less than, let's say, a hundred users a second, a thousand users a second, um, or a thousand queries a second, I think that SQLite is just fine. Um, so let's call 
let's come up with a name for the file. Um, I always like to end the file with a dot SQL light three extension. So we'll just call it DB dot SQL light three. Okay, and let me just post paste bleh, paste my um, create table command. Now, due to some movie magic, um, when I did this one minute ago, which you guys didn't see, there were still quotes in the uh, pasted command, so I have removed them. So if you were literally following along keystroke by keystroke, first of all, good for you. You have a lot of free time. But no, honestly, the it's not going to work. You just have to remove the quotes. Um, so just adding a semicolon at the end of this tells SQLite that we have ended our query. Oh, and it says the table already exists because like I said, I tested this right before this. Well, that's fine. So we can just imagine that we just created the ticket table. Um, if I do dot dump, that's going to show me how I would recreate the database using SQL commands. So this is exactly what is in the database right now. You can see that um, it's an exact copy of the create table command that we entered. Um, and I can do things like select star from ticket. Uh, and of course it gives me nothing, um, which is fine because we haven't entered any data. Um, and in that regard, let's hold off on entering data for now and let's go back to the web application and think about how we're gonna structure that. So control D will bring me out of that and I will go back to my editor window. Okay, um, so here we are back in app.py, and now we're actually going to get started on the web application itself. So when we, as normal, what I always like to do when I'm creating a new application, be it a web app or uh, a script or a library or something even much larger, um, I always start each file by trying to write out the classes and functions that I think I'll need and at least documenting them so I know what they're meant to do because I find that that makes me think about things up front uh, and that's useful because I don't code myself into a corner very often and if I can't think of a description like if I can't create a proper doc string then it's a sign that I haven't thought enough about what I'm about to write and I should probably go back and rethink what I'm doing. So without further ado, we, we know that there are three things that we want to support, um, eventually four, but let's just start with three for now. Uh, so we want to support showing a list of all the tickets in the system. And that would typically be when you first arrive at the page, you see a list of all the entered tickets. We want to support creating a new ticket. Um, so that'll require a form and us entering the information about the tickets on the form. And then we want to be able to show a single ticket in more detail. Um, so that to me suggests three functions and we can name them these lend themselves to very simple names. So we'll say list tickets. Display list of tickets in the system. Um, we'll also create enter ticket. Then of course we're going to oh, sorry about that. Let me okay. View ticket. 
Um, and this function, we know that we're going to, to view a specific ticket, we're going to have to know the ticket's ID. So I'll make that a, a argument to the function. Um, and we'll say display details of the ticket with ID. Okay, so these are all full sentences. They're um, prescriptive in the sense that it tells what the function should be doing. And like we I mentioned in an earlier video, none of these use the word or. That is one of the easiest ways to figure out that you haven't thought enough about what you're going to ask a function to do. Um, or, or, or the word and as well, um, because it suggests that a function is doing more than one thing. And we know from the single responsibility principle that we only want our functions to do a single thing and break things, break units of work up at that level of granularity. So one logical thing, so certainly more than just one line. But so now how do we, if we even had code in here, how would we make this a Flask application? Well, here's where we'll actually finally start um, using Flask. I will import the Flask class, and we will use that to create a um, application object. So Flask works with um, the notion of, of an application object where on the application object is where everything is registered. You'll see what I mean in a second, but it looks a little weird if you haven't seen it before. So app here is an instantiation of the Flask class, and app is our uh, application object. Now, each of these functions that we just created is going to need a way to marry the URL that we want them to live at to the function itself. In Flask, there are two main ways to do this. The first is kind of verbose, uh, and it is on the app. There is a function called add URL rule, and you can see um, in my documentation that just popped up automatically, uh, it takes three or more option or uh, parameters and is requires us to know what rule endpoint and view funk are um, and then you can see basically this example and it goes on more but we don't have to look at what it says down there because what is done in that example is exactly what I'm going to do here so let me close this um, so Flask also has a decorator-based approach to routing. Uh, and the way that we do that is we make app a decor decorator and we call dot route on it. So dot route takes the URL of that we want the function to live at. So in this case, we want list tickets to just be at the root. Uh, and it optionally takes a number of keyword arguments, one of them is the allowed methods, and that's just a list. Now get what I'm doing here is exactly what the default is. So this is a bit redundant, but that's fine. We just want to see that get is the only method that'll be allowed. And uh, Flask is good about enforcing that in the web app when it generates these routes. If you send a different HTTP verb in your request, say a delete, um, it will return with a method not allowed and give you the proper HTTP error code. So it's um, this is one of the areas that it's um, easy to enforce the kind of interaction with your application or your API that, that you want without having to handle each and every single case. Um, so for enter ticket, um, when we think about the design of a, um, a system, especially where 
while we'll, we will create a simple front end for this, ultimately, um, this would probably be an API uh, that powers a front end, which honestly, that's probably the biggest change um, in the web application community since the last time I posted a video. It used to be that you, if you were using Django or Rails or Flask even, um, you were creating these view functions that render templates and the templates were HTML um, with some dynamic code in them. Now with all the JavaScript front-end frameworks in existence, though that rendering of HTML is, is really uh, rendered moot as the frameworks themselves determine uh, the HTML to show via um, HTML partials that um, are very similar to the templates that we use on the back or we used to use on the back end. Um, but what that means is when you're creating a web application, you're almost always creating something that resembles a REST API. And in a REST API, you have resources, which are the nouns of our system. Uh, and we know that ticket is the only noun in our system. And then we have collections, and that is a group of resources. So to display a collection, you would it, it's very clear that list tickets on line 29 is going to display a group of ticket resources. And so that will be our way to show a collection. Um, enter ticket is our way to create a ticket. So it has <clears throat> both a get and a post method. We'll see why in a second. If we were doing just a RESTful API, this would likely only accept a uh, post method. Um, but it, since we're actually going to use um, templates as or templates as with HTML in them, so that we can do uh, an HTML-based system, or rather a simple HTML system, rather than a, a, an API with a front end using something like React or Angular or any number of other ones. Um, we need to be able to get the enter ticket form before we can post it. So the last one, is view ticket um, and so this will live at uh, slash ticket and then we need a way to specify the ID of the ticket that we want to look at so that suggests something that is dynamic um, and the question becomes well how do I put the ID in here I don't know it ahead of time of course so I almost need like a variable and Flask allows us to capture variables um, by putting them in angle brackets. I could also put that the type of ticket ID is an integer, but that's assumed based on the Flask defaults. Um, now you'll see that you'll notice that ticket ID here matches ticket ID here. That is both by design and required. Um, the the way that this capturing works is it forwards whatever it finds after the slash to a argument to the function with that name, so with the name ticket ID. Therefore, we have to name what we, the argument to the function, we have to name it ticket ID. Um, okay, so now we have uh, three endpoints. Um, but of course they don't do anything yet. So let's have them do something very simple, each of them. They'll just print out the names of the uh, functions that they occur in. So let's have this printout list tickets. This will print out, uh, actually not print, return. Um, so I originally wrote 
print there, but uh, I meant return. And the reason I meant return is because Flask allows us to return a string that represents the entire the entirety of the HTTP response. So um, this is useful in uh, almost only in testing um, because there's never a time where you're going to return a string that you're building manually. I mean, you, you literally could write something like this. And actually, let's, I mean, since I'm gone this far, let's just, so we'll see that this will be different than the others. Um, but let's now save this. So, um, I will open a browser and so we'll put this browser window over here and go full screen. Um, now back to the there's something that is not going to work. So the one thing that I haven't done is given us a way to actually run the application uh, object once we invoke the script directly. So we'll use the very common and definitely in my book, if name equals main. So if we are invoking this script directly from the interpreter, then we want to say app.run and we'll set debug equal to true. You'll see what that means in a second. And then we should be good. Um, so I can then do Python app.py and okay, here's the output. It's gonna be, it started a, a built-in web server at localhost colon 5,000. It tells us to hit control C when we wanna quit. Um, it says the debugger is active, and here is the pin code. We'll see what that means in a little bit, but basically it gives you a dynamic debugger. You can think of PDB, it's very much like that, but a little more visual and, and certainly more useful as it breaks exactly at the um, place an exception occurred. Um, so if I go to Chrome and do localhost 5000, uh, so this is equivalent to remember we're just having a slash on it. Um, so if I go to slash ticket, we will see enter ticket. That doesn't look very much different from what we saw before for uh, list tickets, but if we go to the source, uh, we can see that that is the HTML that was returned by the list ticket function. So while it doesn't look much different, it actually is giving us the HTML. And how can we prove that? Well, uh, very simply, we can change this to be bold. Uh, something you also notice is when I saved that file, it detected, Flask detected a change in the application or the file that we were writing. And so it reloads itself. So uh, any templates in it or um, view functions, things of that nature get reloaded. Um, and now if I go back, close this window or close this tab and refresh, I see enter ticket is bolded. And that's because, of course, we're giving it a valid HTML with a the bold tag there. So the last one, the last endpoint was ticket and then a number, and that's just view ticket. So we've seen now that we can at least display text, associate, display text returned from a function that is associated with a specific URL. And again, those URLs are slash, which is just the root, um, slash ticket, which is how we're going to enter tickets, and then slash ticket followed by a ticket ID. That's how we're going to uh, 
uh, view specific tickets. Now, because this ticket ID is dynamic, we can do something somewhat interesting by saying view ticket, and then we'll give it the ticket ID. And so that should return to, that should show us the number that we pass in in the URL. So if I do um, slash ticket and slash one, that'll sh that should show me view ticket one, slash ticket slash three should show me three. Um, and we'll see if that's the case. So if I, okay, so one shows one, three shows three. And I misspoke earlier when I said that it um, defaults to an integer. It actually defaults to, um, or it doesn't really default in the normal sense of the word. It tries to determine what the parameter represents. And if it's coercible to a certain type like integer, it'll use that. So it, it'll start with string and then whatever the more specific type it can be coerced to, it, it will use that. So three as a string can become an int, and so um, the, the int takes precedence over the string. Um, it's not super important, but it's useful to know. Um, and again, we can specify the, um, as I mentioned before, we can specify the type by just giving it colon and then int. So if I reload this, Oh, oops, I, so this is saying the converter ticket ID does not exist. And that's because I put this in the wrong order. It's the type first and then the name. So I'll restart app.py and we'll go to slash one. Now when we go to slash foo, we wouldn't expect it to be able to reach it. And that's exactly right. Now you'll notice it didn't throw an exception it threw a, it gave us a 404 not found. And the reason is, it's not that the URL that we typed in exists and foo is just an error. It literally doesn't exist in terms of our routes. So this will only take, this is only registering slash ticket if an integer follows. If an integer doesn't follow, that's, a completely different URL to Flask. And so it's not that it's this URL with an error, it's a URL that doesn't exist, that is not bound to a function. So it's somewhat interesting. Again, this is, these are types for the um, dynamic portion of a path. Um, and like you might expect, we can actually extend this um, I'll call it foo. Uh, no, I'll just call it var so we don't get confused. And now if we do this, um, we can see that it has reloaded. So if I go to one now, when I hit enter, this should not be found because again, there is no URL registered to just an integer. It's only an integer then followed by a slash and a string. And we do get the not found. Now, if I do one slash foo, I do get what we expected, one comma foo, or one, or the ID slash the um, variable that is captured by bar. Um, but of course that's not necessary, so we'll delete all that. Um, and we'll get back to the database for a second. So we have this list tickets function that's going to live at the route that is just the, um, the slash, but we need a way to, or we need to actually have data to show. So we can't show all the tickets if there are no tickets in the database. So. <clears throat> what we'll do is just manually enter the first couple of tickets. I'm going to stop the server and call SQLite on 
db.sqlite3. If you forget what we actually had, we can just do dump. Um, so that's the, um, the oh, sorry, this is the um, uh, table that we created. And now we want to insert a row into that table. So if I do insert into ticket values. Uh, so the primary key. So we're actually going to keep track of the ID. It's not auto incrementing, although we could have made it that if for the sake of simplicity, I kept it so that it doesn't auto increment and we'll just keep track of making sure that that value is unique for now. Um, okay, so the change, remember that's an enumeration talking about, is it a bug, is it a new feature? So we'll, we'll call it feature title is um, add a contact form description, please add a contact form to my website, submit her name, email, website, File. I don't know why that is. Oh, shoot. Um, yeah, I misspoke earlier. Uh, not null is the default. Um, we have to give null when we want a field to be nullable. Um, so I'll just leave it blank for now. Date created. We should be able to call the date function. And let's see. Um, now if I do select star from ticket, we can see everything that we entered. Um, I, I could turn on the column headings, but I think we all get the idea. Um, so I'm going to create a second one just so we have more than one thing to display. So we'll ask to add an FAQ. And everything else remains the same. Oh. So of course, already forgot that we have to keep our ID unique. We have to change this from zero to one. But it's helpful that SQLite is preventing us from doing that, which you know would result in having no way of referring uniquely to either of the rows. So there would be no way for me to get refer to the first row unless I knew what the title was or knew something else besides its ID. Um, so that's why having a unique ID is important so we can refer to it without having to know its contents ahead of time. Uh, okay, so now we have two values, two rows entered into the table, and we can start to implement the uh, list function, the list tickets function. Um, so when we create the, when we were working with the database, we're going to be using SQLite 3. So we'll just say import 6.3. That's a standard Python package. Um, so get rid of this line. And first we need to create a connection to our database. Of course, it's really just opening a file. Uh, 3.connect and db.6.3. OK, so now that we have a connection, we need a cursor. And a cursor I'll describe in a little bit, but um, the easiest way to think about it is a cursor when we're doing queries keeps track of transactions and also our place in um, 
fetching results if we don't get them all at the same time. So if we have a million results and we want to get a hundred at a time, the cursor is the actual object that keeps track of where we are in the result list. Um, but it also uh, is used in um, operating transactionally on queries. For us, though, we're, we're not really that concerned, especially with the select statement. So we can just do cursor.execute. And this is just raw SQL, select star from ticket. Um, and so now we need to get the results and save them into some sort of variable. So we'll say all tickets equals cursor.fetchall. So this is saying to the cursor, which keeps track of the results, um, just give me all the results and put them in here. I'm, I'm not going to try to get them a little bit at a time. Uh, and then what we want to return is a Flask built-in function called render template. Uh, so again, we're going to create an HTML template to display this. Um, and for now, we'll just assume that it exists, even though obviously it doesn't. But render template with the template name, which we'll call index.html, um, and we'll give it, so along with the template name, we also need to give it any dynamic variables that we need to be able to access from within the template. Uh, so all tickets is definitely um, something that, that we're gonna need to make reference to. So we'll say tickets equals, all tickets. So that's just saying assign the variable tickets within the template to the value of all tickets, which here is all the tickets that we have. Um, so I'll save that. We need to import render template right there. <clears throat> um, and now we will actually create the template. So um, if so Flask expects um, a directory called templates, and that's where it expects the template to live. And I'll just create a new file in templates called index.html, which of course has appeared on another screen. So instead of that, let me just do here, templates, index.html, and here is all of this crazy um, boilerplate. So really, this is all up, up at the top. This is all just um, bootstrap plus uh, a title, really. Uh, and then these two containers that are just going to uh, encapsulate the content. So for the content, um, I have it saved down here. We'll just um, cut and paste. Um, fix the uh, alignment of everything. And now we should be good to go. So what we've done is just created a list of tickets. And in that list, see this un this uh, unordered list uh, has this this is the only real dynamic part of it um, it says for ticket in tickets you'll remember tickets is the variable name that we assigned when we called render template and we're gonna create a little card that shows the ticket um, and this zero and one here, you'll see what that means in a second. It's it's really an artifact of us dealing directly with SQL without any um, of the niceties that we would get from an ORM or even just a, a reasonable library. Um, and the other uh, somewhat dynamic thing is the what it's going to um, show at the bottom is a link to our enter ticket page as a button that says create ticket. So this, going back now to the web app and starting it, or the terminal, starting the web app. 
So if I go now to just the slash, no such table ticket. Interesting. Uh, I could have sworn that we had created a table called ticket. Uh, okay. So th it's clear what's wrong here. We are missing. The so we're missing the three on the end of SQLite. And you can see that when we connected, it actually created, SQLite actually created the database. Um, and that's why we had that SQLite, that file named SQLite sitting there. Um, so now if we start the application again and reload, this is, by the way, the debugger I was talking about. I won't be able to use it right now because I already had stopped the application, but um, we would, if we wanted to, be able to go in at any place and not only see the, the code that was being called and where it is in the, in the stack, but by clicking this uh, little button here, it opens an interactive shell in this stack frame so that we can inspect the values of things. So anyway, I'm going to refresh. And hey, look, there we are, open tickets. Um, and so it says feature as the description here. Um, so that's what, what now when we go back to the zero one thing, um, uh, oops, it's in the, so ticket.0 and ticket.1, what is returned from cursor.fetchAll and what we're passing in as each ticket is a tuple. And it's not even a, a named tuple. Um, it's just a tuple where each element represents a field in the given row. So ticket.0 well, we made that the um, anchor target because that would respond slash ticket slash, and we know we need the ID, and that's the first field. Now, ticket dot one is the happens to be the um, what did we call it? The um, the change or type of change field. So. If you remember, those were both features in the um, database that, that database rows that we had entered, and so that's not very useful. So let's just change it to the title, and to figure out the title, what number that should be, we could just count zero is ID, one is change, two then is title. So I'll change this to two, save the file, and refresh. And now we have the proper um, ticket display that gives us actually some useful information. So, um, and if we look down at the bottom of the screen there to the URL that this is pointing at, it's slash ticket slash zero. When I hover over this link, it's slash ticket slash one. Of course, we haven't written them yet, but it looks like that at least is, uh, is reasonable. And if I hover over the button to create a ticket, we'll see it's slash ticket. Uh, and again, that's what we want. That's what we have set up. So going back to the code here, uh, I'll close this template out for now. Um, what we have is three functions, one of which we're basically done with. Uh, that displays all the tickets in the system. Uh, we have two left to do, the enter ticket and view ticket. Um, and that this is a good stopping point. We will pick up next time with the implementation of enter ticket and view ticket using just raw SQL. And after that, we will be switching to use the SQL Alchemy ORM. And you'll see just how easy it is to create Flask applications with a database. Um, and certainly shorter in the amount of time than this. This was me explaining everything, but start to finish, most people could do this in about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, so until next time, thank you for sticking with me, and I appreciate the support that I've gotten from everyone. I do apologize 
from the bottom of my heart, I it, it has been far, far too long since the last video. That will not be the case going forward, uh, and I appreciate your time.